Sadna Tandon calls her pet dog Pepper her lifeline. She says the pup keeps her on her toes all day. Something which she says was not possible just a couple of months ago. 63-year-old Sadna was infected with the coronavirus during the second wave. While her initial infection was not severe, a few days after testing negative, she was diagnosed with cardiac inflammation, a post-COVID complication which left her with a crippling weakness for months. I used to feel so weak, so weak that I would, at times used to feel like I can't even sit, I must lie down. I hardly had any stamina. I was though a very active person earlier and I started feeling depressed also. I used to feel very low. Sadna's case is not exceptional. Many other people have suffered from post-COVID complaints. Dr. Ayush Gupta says patients have come to him with complications like headache, fatigue, depression, palpitations and cardiac issues among others. A staggering number, that is 60 to 70 percent of patients who recover from COVID have these effects on them. There are some kind of risk factors which predict long COVID. Duration of illness is one, severity of illness is second. It is not completely understood. It is a science in evolution. So even young patients may be experiencing more symptoms than an elderly high-risk patient. 30-year-old Roshni Devakar was an avid yoga practitioner. She says she was at her healthiest stage when she tested positive during the second wave and her infection was quite mild. But soon after, she started experiencing complications and was diagnosed with a balance disorder called vestibular disorder, which makes her feel dizzy and causes constant ringing in her ears. It's like being on a boat all the time. So when I stand, it, the floor is like this. So for me to walk straight is a struggle. There was a point where I ne literally needed to be lifted to go anywhere because I just couldn't get my balance. It can be very overwhelming and exhausting. While for Roshni, it has been rehabilitative therapy and yoga that have helped her gain a sense of control over her condition. For Sadhna, it's been medication, ample rest and her pup pepper which helped her with her post-COVID complication. He sleeps with me, he eats with me, <laughs> like a small child. I have a grandchild home now. <laughs> Sadna says she is a lot better now as she has found some happy distraction with Pepper. But for many like her, the lingering effect of COVID remains inexplicable. <laughs>
Dr. Fromhold says the fresh sea air, which is low in dust and high in humidity, is great for the lungs. But most important is what she calls pacing. Not overdoing anything and only moderate exercise. 59-year-old Anke Andersen Wilms recently checked in for long COVID treatment. The geriatric care nurse caught the coronavirus before a vaccine was available. Her patients got it too. They all died. The trauma runs deep. She hardly sleeps at night. You can almost say I've aged 10 years, you know, strength, concentration, everything's down. I used to lift people weighing 60 or 70 kilos out of bed, and now I'm happy when I can pull my suitcase along behind me. Everything has changed enormously, and I've got no idea where things go from here. The experts aren't any wiser, as I found out back in the office in Berlin during a digital press conference. And they can't even yet say how many people will be affected by long COVID. It's really important to remember there could possibly be changes brought on by the illness that people haven't yet noticed or don't show symptoms of at all, but that could potentially have long-term consequences, such as in dementia. We need to look at that and investigate more closely and better our understanding. A lot of people are getting Omicron, but aren't even getting sick. That's something I talked about with Hamburg cardiologist Raphael Tverenbold. When the body comes into contact with the virus in an unprotected state, in an unvaccinated state, you have to assume that Omicron will also affect organs. And even in the Omicron era, we recommend to anyone possibly still not vaccinated that they should protect themselves against infection. And for us, that also means getting vaccinated. And with Omicron so widespread, if even just a small percentage of patients get long COVID, we're talking millions of people here in Germany alone. Lots of people think that if we all just get infected with Omicron, then it doesn't matter in the end. But I can see clearly that vaccinated and boosted patients have an almost 70% lower chance of contracting long COVID. If young people can be saved from having their lives upended because of long COVID, then it's a decisive argument in favour of vaccination. So all that's left for me to do is take a deep breath of fresh sea air, take it easy, and wait a few more months to see if I really do get the all clear from long COVID. My head's telling me, go there and do that, but my body just isn't up to it. It can't get moving. You can't tell by looking at me. A stranger wouldn't suspect how quickly I reach my limit. Doris R. suffers from long COVID. The nurse caught COVID twice, and for a year now, she's been more or less unable to work. At Erlangen's University Hospital, Dr. Bettina Hoberger regularly checks her patient's ability to concentrate. Since the pandemic began, she and her team have been trying to find the root cause of long COVID. And they're making headway. They've discovered circulatory disorders in the eyes of a number of long COVID patients. The eyes are special, as we often see complaints there that relate to the whole body. That's nothing new. We observe the effects of diabetes and high blood pressure in the eye. What we've seen with patients after a COVID-19 infection is that the narrowest blood capillaries aren't as well supplied with blood as those in a healthy person. The lighter the back of the eye looks, the better its circulation. If it's too dark, something's wrong. In the image of the healthy eye on the left, the intricately branching blood vessels are mainly white. With long COVID patients, poor circulation means the proportion of black is higher. The next step was to conduct precise blood tests. 
they revealed the presence of autoimmune antibodies, proteins which hinder circulation, a kind of antibody also found in heart and eye ailments. We knew this phenomenon had a negative impact on circulation. We also knew there was a drug in the pipeline that could neutralize this autoimmune response. So we had the idea of administering this medication, BC007, which we knew could render autoantibodies harmless in the hope that it would improve patients' symptoms. Axel Nagat wouldn't have been able to climb these stairs a year ago. After a mild case of coronavirus, he developed increasingly severe long COVID symptoms. Nagat was easily exhausted and could barely concentrate. He sat at home for months on end and was just the shadow of his former self. I'd go to brush my teeth, pick up my toothbrush and wonder what to do next. I had complete blackouts, walking straight, impossible. Keeping my balance, no way. The compulsory touch-your-nose test, total fail. During those difficult months, Axel Nagat's boss at the Sparkasse Savings Bank gave him lots of support. Nevertheless, like many other long COVID sufferers, he fell into a black hole. The bank employee says few people can understand just how bad you feel. Many long COVID patients I've met in Erlangen don't have anyone batting for them. Those around them dismiss it, saying, stop making such a fuss. Come on, pull yourself together. You just need to get more sleep and not go out so much. All that baloney. If you haven't had it yourself, you have no idea. Once a month, Axel Nagat goes to Erlangen's University Hospital. Last May, his problems ceased. He was the first long COVID patient to get the experimental drug BC007, which improved his circulation. Two weeks later, he felt well again. I'm mentally and physically fit again. I can be physically active without feeling wiped out for two weeks afterwards. I can go hiking again. It's such a gift. It's like being reborn. I can't put it any differently. The doctors were also amazed by the rapid improvement in the first patient. And three others were given BC007. Since reports about the drug's impact were published, requests have poured in. The results were more pronounced than we dared hope for. We thought symptoms directly associated with poor circulation would improve, but that taste would too was something we hadn't even considered. Nurse Doris R. is also hoping she might get a chance to take BC007 and return to work. I'm prepared to try out all sorts of stuff because things can hardly get worse. My quality of life is nothing like it was in the past. But Dr. Hoberger can't just keep on treating new patients with a drug that has yet to be approved. The next step would be a larger scale study with BC007. Of course, we're hoping it will help many patients. But we're aware that not all long COVID cases are the same. Some patients have permanent lung damage, scarring, for example, due to acute infection. The drug won't help them because their problem isn't caused by an autoimmune response. But for those whose symptoms are autoimmune-based, we're hoping it will improve their condition. If these encouraging results are anything to go by, BC007 could be a real lifeline for the growing number of long COVID sufferers. I generally try to avoid answering questions like this because it seems like the point behind them is to feed this vaccinated versus unvaccinated, this kind of us versus them narrative. 
And, and, and people, we need to get past that. It needs to be us versus the virus, not us versus each other. But, but I want to talk about this topic anyway, because numbers like mortality statistics are often used to feed rumor mills on social media. Now, the first thing to say is that a simple head-to-head -head comparison of raw numbers of COVID deaths between vaccinated and unvaccinated people is pretty pointless because they're going to vary from country to country depending on a wide range of factors. They include, for instance, um, age demographics. Countries that have more elderly people, for example, will see more deaths even among the vaccinated than places with younger populations because COVID-19 is a disease that's a lot more deadly for people over 50 than it is for people under 30. But what makes a straight up comparison of mortality even less significant and informative is something that seems paradoxical, which is that the more people are vaccinated in a population, the more deaths you're going to see in vaccinated people, which sounds counterintuitive, actually, when you say it that way, but it's, but it's really simple math. Let's look at a theoretical example. Imagine COVID hitting a country of 100 people where 90 people are vaccinated and 10 aren't. Four of those 100 end up dying from the disease, two from each group. On social media suddenly, reports start making the rounds that half the people dying of the disease are vaccinated. Now that's not wrong, but it's a kind of half-truth. Essential information is missing, and that's that 20% of all unvaccinated people are dying from the disease, but only around 2% of the vaccinated. The takeaway has been distorted. This was just a, a made up example to illustrate the point, but experts say it holds true for what we're seeing now. Uh, the vaccines that we have are really good at preventing hospitalizations and death, but they're not perfect. Add in waning effectiveness over time, especially among the elderly, and of course, there's going to be some mortality among the vaccinated as well. But the vital question then becomes not how many vaccinated people are dying, but instead, how do the risks of dying from an infection compare between those who are fully vaccinated and those who aren't? And there, the numbers are unequivocal. National healthcare authorities in a number of countries continue to agree that someone who is unvaccinated is many, many times more likely to die of COVID-19 if they get it than someone who's fully vaccinated. Vivian McGarrow used to be a keen singer. In her free time, she sang in a band, and she'd sing when she made her dinner. But all that stopped two months ago, after she was diagnosed with COVID-19. The first symptom that I think everyone will tell you is exhaustion. Being exhausted just basically by doing nothing. Um, or, or doing a small activity and then you just get really exhausted. When Vivian became infected, she had trouble breathing and had to be hospitalized. But her symptoms never fully went away. Like the blood clots in her lungs. Virologist Duncan Nukuri is investigating long COVID cases in Kenya. He describes some of the more common signs. These symptoms may include um, a persistent cough, um, a persist maybe fatigue, um, maybe um, muscle and joint pains. Um, I've had those who have memory uh, lapses or memory issues and so on. So they can be just a continuation of the symptoms they had 
when they were sick or new emerging symptoms. So far, more than 3.3 million people have been tested in Kenya. 300,000 positive cases have been confirmed, and over 5,000 people have died. There are no reliable figures, though, on how many people develop long COVID, but they are believed to number in the tens of thousands. Let's say f five years from now, um, of all those patients who had severe lung damage, um, how many of them will progress and um, will need uh, continuous care? So I think we, it's time we start also thinking of the post-COVID period, uh, the post-COVID complications, um, and how to take care of these people. Vivian goes to the hospital for regular follow-up examinations. But there is no treatment here for long COVID ailments. The doctors are at a loss. I really hope things will get better as well, and I hope to recover and get back to where I used to be and how I used to live, so yes. But there has been one sign that's given her hope. For the past few days, she hasn't felt quite so exhausted. Perhaps long COVID will go away on its own. Ashley Jackson caught COVID early in the pandemic, but has now been suffering from long COVID for two years. One of the worst symptoms she's having to deal with is chronic pain throughout her body, but getting treatment has been difficult. My experience has been a lot of medical gaslighting in the last two years. I think as a black woman, um, there's just a lot of medical myths that are not being dispelled in medical communities. And so there's the myth that black people don't feel as much pain as someone else. And like, it's clearly not true for a chronic pain patient to not be experiencing pain. Feeling abandoned by medical professionals, Ashley has found support in a private online group set up for fellow long COVID sufferers in the black, indigenous and people of color or BIPOC community. I found that there was a BIPOC group that they had set up that was particularly dedicated to people of color who were navigating these very nuanced experiences. And I think that that definitely validated some of my concerns, some of my medical gaslighting issues. And, you know, if there was a test that I got that was not correct, then they would indicate what I should do next. And there was really a community set up for us to hopefully navigate this well. Long COVID is an invisible illness which makes it difficult to diagnose and treat. The online group provides Ashley with confirmation and reassurance. I think it's made a huge difference having people that you can go to that are quite literally walking the same paths as you um, and quite literally navigating the same circumstances, invisible illness as, as a person of colour. It's like, a, <laughs> it's just a setup that in a structure that is not set for people of colour to succeed medically is just wrong. So having that support team is everything. A long history of racial discrimination has affected the trust many in black communities have in doctors and medical institutions. A poll conducted during the pandemic found that a majority of black Americans have little faith in the healthcare system, leading to low vaccination rates and reluctance to seek early treatment. The truth is, within the healthcare system itself, part of the reason that mistrust exists today is because the experiences of the past um, align with experiences that people are having today, themselves, their family members, their friends. Ashley is making small steps to recovery, but at times her fight against long COVID was only about survival. I think originally that just battling COVID was scary because nobody knew it was really going on in the early stages of 2020. Um, I didn't think I was going to live to see 21 or to graduate. Um, so coming to terms with like my own premature death was really scary. Ashley Jackson now has that terrifying experience behind her, but she says her struggle to recover from long COVID has only been exacerbated by persistent realities of racial discrimination.